Okay. Good afternoon. If you are in Miss Clifford's period four class and you are working on your enduring issues assignment, let's just finish this up. Okay. Do it again. Okay, so we started this today in class. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen share, hopefully, because I cannot see you, although you should still be able to see me somewhere. Okay, so the enduring issue, all I did was pick an article from this magazine, Foreign Affairs, November, December, 2022. So it is current. Okay, the article that we picked to do as a full family, as a whole class, was the unwinnable war, America's blind spots in Afghanistan, written by Laurel Miller, the fifth act, America's end in Afghanistan by Elliot Ackerman. So there are two texts here in this review essay of that which is current. There are two texts. Um, okay, so we started this how to approach the enduring issues project the enduring issues essay and we talked about in period four that you cannot endure an issue if you haven't seen how to endure that issue how to internalize that issue how to understand it um so when you endure an issue you understand it so well that you can verbalize and or write about it with fluency right so this is what i would do if I had this assignment, if I were in, in high school, again, this is how I would approach this assignment so I could achieve mastery. Okay, so we have to read it and annotate. Okay. Okay. All right. So, okay. In August 2021, Afghanistan was thrust back into the headlines. Taliban forces rapidly closed in on Kabul and the United States began making its final military withdrawal. Suddenly, the world was confronted with images of desperate people squeezing their way into Kabul's airport for a chance to flee. Almost overnight, nearly everything that the United States and its allies had accomplished in 20 years of fighting, spending, and building in Afghanistan disintegrated so it crumbled for the one million or so americans who had taken part in those failed endeavors and for the millions of young afghans who had grown up under a western backed democracy flawed though it was such losses were head spinning with their livelihoods imperiled like in danger and with many fearful for their lives, hundreds of thousands of Afghans sought to leave the country like they, they sought. That was their objective. They wanted to leave their own country, posing a new challenge for withdrawing Western forces. The United States didn't expect to mount such a large evacuation, or at least not so quickly. Over 10 days, the U.S. military and its allies airlifted about 120,000 people, including 80,000 Afghans, from Kabul, mostly to military bases in the Middle East, from where they eventually left for the United States and elsewhere. The effort was chaotic. For those without a U.S. passport or visa, Often the only ticket out was a personal connection to someone who could pull strings with United States personnel on the ground. American veterans, former diplomats, aid workers, and journalists scrambled to find passage for vulnerable Afghans. Many Afghans who wanted to leave were turned away. Amid this crisis, okay, and we should be annotating, sorry. Amid this crisis, right? 
big conflict here. Many Americans who had served in Afghanistan were angry that the evacuation was so haphazard and left behind so many Afghans they believed to be at risk. Okay. One of those Americans was Elliot Ackerman. So this is our main character or our author, so to speak, who served in Afghanistan as a Marine and later as an advisor to Afghan counterterrorism teams under the CIA-led program. In the final weeks before the United States withdrawal, he joined a series of impromptu efforts to help evacuate small groups of Afghans. Ackerman used his connections to the United States military and other agencies involved in the evacuation to help Afghans get into Kabul airport and onto planes. So Kabul is a city in Afghanistan. It's one of their main cities. I don't recall if, if it's their capital city. It might be. But they are wanting to the families and the people who live there, they are wanting to now flee Afghanistan. In the fifth act, Ackerman describes these efforts interweaving the account of withdrawal with his combat experience and views on what went wrong with the war. So you already know that there's conflict, right? Which is one of your nine enduring issues. Conflict is everywhere, just like the problem where the conflict exists in ELA, so does it also exist in global studies in real life. So even if you couldn't identify the enduring issue past a problem, past a conflict, that would answer, that would, that, that's valid. For decades, United States veterans, war veterans, have written books that use their intimate experiences of war to challenge the prevailing wisdom of US strategists and military planners in Washington, right? So basically what this means is this man, Elliot Ackerman, he served in the military in the United States. And he is now reflected on his experience and he is writing a book so that we can get it right. Okay, because we've been, the United States has, has been a presence in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. And as a result, people shouldn't want to flee that country. So, um, so there's, it's, it, whatever we did over 20 years didn't work. So he's now reflecting on why it is that it didn't work, right? Okay. <laughs> This is not the case with the fifth act. Paradoxically, in setting out to explore the missed opportunities of the United States led war and the botched withdrawal, Ackerman ends up reflecting the same misguided mindset that drove the war's architects. So in this article, you are getting the perspective of this man, Elliot Ackerman, who wrote a book, but his book is being criticized by Lauren Miller. So you're getting the history in like three lenses. It's indifferent, it's factual, but then it's persuasive under Ackerman and under Miller. So this is the perfect article, the perfect review essay for your Enduring Essays project, because it actually outlines and stipulates how you're going to write it. And it's chock full of history. So you have to start somewhere. Might as well start here at the top, right? Okay. Looking at the conduct of the war through a narrow, through a narrow aperture, like a narrow lens, he focuses, as Washington did, largely on U.S. forces and U.S. policy. The politics, motivations, and experiences of Afghans are pushed off stage. In doing so, however, we go back to the top. 
Okay. The book usefully, if inadvertently, reveals many blind spots that compromised Washington's strategy. So a blind, blind spots are places where we don't see. These are things that we did not um, predict. So when coming up with this plan to um, over 20 years, build a Western democracy in Afghanistan, which is a country in the Middle East located on the continent of Asia. These are the things, there were problems because, of course, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't see the future. So these blind spots um, compromised the strategy to, um, to augment this country so that it operates as close to a representative democracy as we do, and it didn't work. Okay, curtains up. Ackerman's book is divided into five parts, or acts, hence the title, and the drama proceeds by combining a number of disparate narrative strands. The most resonant ones, the most resonant one centers on Ackerman's combat experience and describes two missions in which he participated as a Marine Special Operations Team Leader in 2008. In each mission, one of his comrades was tragically killed. This narrative intends to convey the importance of the leave no one behind ethos in U.S. military, a theme that resurfaces in the evacuation narrative. So he's telling us, they're, it, they're giving us a synopsis. Listen, this part of the text, um, the theme is, um, the theme is, okay, to not leave anyone behind. That's the ethic, right? That's the mindset. Um, uh, however, <laughs> However, how does that how does that connect to the conflict, right? How does it how does it connect to this enduring issue? Right. Okay. So let's keep reading and annotating. In the aftermath of a mission gone wrong, Ackerman is particularly haunted by having had inadequate personnel and equipment left to retrieve the body of one of his men. So one man died right, in the line of fire in Afghanistan, and he could not retrieve the man and then bring him home, in a sense. He decides to defer the task to another unit of Marines in the interest of protecting the lives of others under his command. But he writes that a measure of guilt settled its weight on me. More than a dozen years later, he still carries the weight of regret about this, de this decision. So Ackerman was in Afghanistan, and he was uh, on the ground. He was one of the soldiers there. And one of his, one of his uh, men, one of his soldiers, died. And he had to, instead of collecting the man himself and or having his unit collect the man and carry him home, who was, was dead, he called in another unit not to sacrifice everybody who was in his unit for one person. And that, that weighs on his conscience. That bothers him that he had to do that because he, didn't, he was ill-equipped to attend to his own soldier who was killed um, on the front lines while he was there. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> okay. And Ackerman's prose successfully transports the reader to the battlefield and into the mist of ambiguities, ambiguities like things that are unclear, things that we don't know, facing young combatants required to make life and death decisions. He writes lovingly of his comrades, bringing them to life and heightening the poignancy of the stories he tells. But that message about military valor is overshadowed by the powerful illustration he provides of wasted life. 
right? So we don't want our time on this earth to be wasted. We don't want to exist just to exist. We don't want to take Regents exams and come into school every day just because somebody tells us to. We want our time here to be purposeful because we want to make a difference for the better, for the greater good. That's how we want to contribute to our society, to our global community. One of the missions on which one of Ackerman's comrades died achieved no apparent military objectives. Ackerman notes that the team did not find the Taliban forces they were looking for, leaving readers with a sense of counterinsurgency's futility. So, so the team, they didn't achieve their objective. You know, and so that that uselessness, that feeling of futility, he describes that in his text. So this is this is how Ackerman makes history jump off the page or transcend the text so that when we learn about it, we can internalize it. So this enduring issue is not just for us to endure, but so also for everybody. We all need to endure this so that we can learn from it. Okay. Yet, Ackerman's warfighting narrative fails to address why the United States lost. Ackerman skates over crucial problems with how the United States military carried out the war. For example, in describing his work as a CIA paramilitary operator, during which he advised an Afghan counterterrorism unit established and funded by the agency, he does not seem to recognize that these teams were a double-edged sword. He celebrates their tactical successes, such as when they kill or capture enemy targets. So a double-edged sword, right? So look how even in a... Um, a historical text, the author is using a literary device, double-edged sword, right, figurative language, to um, make us understand, to help the reader understand what we're reading. Um, but he ignores the mountain of evidence that their routine night raids on villages, including ones in which he took part, fomented bitterness towards foreign militaries and undermined the Afghan government's ability to build popular support. Okay, so basically, when you have a country, and the country in this case is Afghanistan, and you have another country's military babysitting this country so that they can become more like us and less like them. It's a problem, Lauren Miller, this, this girl, this lady is saying it's a problem of that which Ackerman did not address, okay? So one of the reasons why after 20 years, Afghanistan does not have, um, a, a government that is more, more similar to and or like a democracy like ours. One of the reasons why they had to do an evacuation was because the militaries, the presence of the United States military in that country undermined the Afghan government's ability to make decisions and to create buy-in and stakeholders and to build consensus amongst its people so that, so that we can leave and they can continue developing this, this government that is like, a, like, like ours. So you, you can't force people, you can't, threaten them, using the military to teach and model what, how their government should govern is not the answer because it didn't work here. And if you're doing these, 
how do you say he says read night reads if you're conducting night reads on villages it makes the Af the afghan government look weak because they can't control this this foreign force they, we, they can't control how we behave in their country so why should they why should they ascribe and or aspire to be more democratic why should they aspire to be more like us if we're um if we're not respectful um of who they are or of where they want to go with their country okay consider also an operation that ackerman describes that took place in the Zerko, Zerko, Zerko Valley in Herat province in 2008 when he was a Marine. He briefly notes that a U.S. general had to pressure Afghan President Hamid Karzai to green light the operation because Karzai had concerns about civilian casualties. He also dismissively refers to the tribal politics Okay. that had allowed Zerko Valley to become a ta Taliban sanctuary. But Ackerman leaves out the fact that a year earlier, U.S. airstrikes in the same area killed dozens of civilians, causing local outrage and demonstrations against the government. Okay, so Miller, Lauren Miller, who's writing this article is accusing Ackerman, Elliot Ackerman, who wrote a book about this current situation in Afghanistan of being selective in his uh, release, in his um, telling of the tale and his retelling of history and that he isn't giving us all the information. Okay, so if so imagine so like imagine um imagine that your town or your village or like our classroom like imagine in the classroom which is a microcosm of society you have a teacher and the teacher is miss clifford but yet also in the classroom running the show is a committee of other teachers from another school, from another country, who are, are not allowing students to voice their opinions or participate or ask questions or read aloud or engage in group work or speak their mind. No matter how the class is run, the students are not going to ascribe to this type of classroom this type of learning be, because they don't have a role in it. They don't have a voice. It's the same here. If you isolate or kill um, civilians of Afghanistan and or Kabul and of wherever it is that the United States is occupying, people aren't going to want to be like you. People aren't going to listen to you. They're not. Why should people who are, who are struggling with with the United States occupying, keep them living in Afghanistan. If it's not a positive experience, they're not going to want to become whatever we want them to become, which is more democratic, more like us. They're not going to want to govern themselves like that because we're in their way. Although the United States never made an accounting of their casualties, the Afghan government let's go back up, claimed that 42 had been killed and Human Rights Watch reported at least 25 deaths. Karzai's concerns were justified and no Afghan leader could simply brush aside tribal, tribal politics as Ackerman seems to propose. So you cannot say, you cannot say, oh, um, you, um, the city of Kabul, okay, forget about these deaths, pretend they never happened. Let's, um, let's continue. 
let's continue doing what the United States tells us. Like you, you have to, these, these deaths people remember, right? There's civilian deaths in Afghanistan. Those families in Kabul or wherever they are in Afghanistan, I believe we're in Kabul, they, they don't forget. So if, if you don't, um, if you don't acknowledge and then apologize for these innocent civilian deaths, whatever you're trying to do politically, people aren't going to listen to you because they don't want you there because you're a threat to them. In recounting another 2008 operation, this time in Farah province, Ackerman refers to a turbaned man and his family who were turned out of their home. The man shouted at the Marines, searching his home each time he heard the sound of an item crashing to the floor. Ackerman misses a chance to discuss the corrosive effect of foreign invaders repeatedly harassing Afghan civilians a mistake that U.S. policymakers and Pentagon planners made as well. The fifth act mirrors another flaw in the thinking of strategists in Washington about U.S. forces, sorry, about what U.S. forces could achieve in Afghanistan. Ackerman advised a large group of Afghan commandos, as well as CIA-led counterterrorism units. Yet these men are no more than bit players in his story. Repeatedly, Ackerman refers to our war, my war, us, and our Afghan tragedy. In doing so, he calls to mind the habit of U.S. policymakers to see themselves as the primary protagonists of the war and to perceive the conflict in Afghanistan as an American initiative built around the United States, bending Afghans to its will, rather than as one in which the actions and motivations of Afghans on both sides would hold ultimate sway. That's it. That to me right there, that's the core. That's the answer to this long, long article. This is why the war is unwinnable, okay? And if you'll notice, like, just like in ELA, again, the term protagonist, right? Like the, the hero or like the main character in the text, in doing so, Ackerman calls to mind the habit of United States policymakers to see themselves as the primary protagonists, like the heroes or the main characters of the war, and to perceive the conflict, right, because conflict, the problem in Afghanistan as an American initiative built around the United States, bending Afghans to its will. Okay, the problems of one country, Lauren Miller is saying, eh, though, should not be an invitation for us to propagate an, a political initiative and then force via a ground roots campaign through the United States military who's occupying Afghanistan we should not force them to do our bidding and or to mirror the democratic, the representative democracy that we have in our country. It's not gonna work there. So you cannot force them to bend to what we want because that's wrong. We're not heroes, now we're the enemy. You cannot get adults and people to where you want them to be just because you want them to be there, just because in your mind, you think it's better. Yes, the way we a representative democracy, a Western model, this is the West, we're North America, we're the superpower. It works for us. Their country in Afghanistan, even if they're set up for that, 
they may not want that. And if you don't ask them what they want, then it means you don't care what they want. So you're essentially forcing your ideas and ideologies down their throats. You can't do that. You can't get adults to where you want them to be without asking them where they want to be. You can't do that. You have to take their voice into consideration. Okay. So, so the Afghans do hold ultimate sway, like their opinions of how they want their country to um, grow. That is important that you ask them that and then work with them to enact those changes. It is not appropriate for you to place a United States military for, for over 20 years in Afghanistan and then say, do it. Do it because I said to and be do it because I said so and because I have a gun. You can't threaten people into, into um, conforming to what you think is the right way to govern their country. Afghanistan is not a satellite nation of the United States. So we can try to help them, but helping them means working alongside them and being collegial and respectful of their culture and religion and how they want to do this, how they want to grow and build. It doesn't mean to just take it upon our own selves and do what we want because we know best. Because that's a very white, like that's a very one-sided, very narrow-minded white perspective. And the West is not best. And white is not right. In the face of the Taliban's rapid reconquest of the country in 2021, Ackerman seems baffled by the bitter and humiliating defeat by a far inferior force. But he looks for answers only in US policy errors and to a lesser extent in the failings of US backed Afghan government. Okay, on a wing and a prayer, waiting for evacuation from Kabul, Afghanistan, August 2021. So these are families. Okay, let's look at the let's look at the visual text in addition to reading. So these are people. These are families waiting. There is a plane up there somewhere waiting to be evacuated. This is their country that they're fleeing. They're evacuating. As a result of, I'm trying to figure it out, as a result of the Taliban's rapid reconquest of the country in 2021. Okay. okay. The Taliban, an enemy poorly understood by the United States, are largely missing from his picture. Ackerman tries to explain why the United States lost, yet he overlooks half the equation. The real story is not only one of United States failure, but of Taliban success, owing to strong motivation, owing to strong motivation, organizational resilience, and support from outside the country, particularly Pakistan. Okay. So the Taliban um, reclaimed Afghanistan 20 years later by this method. Strong motivation, organ organizational resilience, and support from outside the country, Pakistan. Okay, blame game. Ackerman is least persuasive when he strays from his own memoir, memories of combat in Afghanistan. When the book comments on policy and politics, it offers no basis for its reasoning besides Ackerman's personal experience. Ackerman leans heavily on the idea that the United States lost the war because we never understood what winning meant. Okay.
but he never makes clear what in his own view winning meant. A better explanation for Washington's failures in Afghanistan is that the United States should have focused from the outset on how to end the war, not how to win it. That might have meant seeking to prevent an insurgency from gaining traction in the first place by including the Taliban early on as minority stakeholders. In the post-2001 government, because in 2001, that was September 11th, when the Taliban, when Osama bin Laden and the Taliban attacked the World Trade Towers in New York. That's why they're citing that. Or it could have meant negotiating seriously with the Taliban, oh my God, at the height of US power around 2011, rather than waiting to do so until 2019, at which point US influence in the country was approaching its nadir in the United States. And the United States leaders had made clear their intention to pull out. Quiet negotiations with the insurgents began in 2009, but proceeded in fits and starts and lacked strong political commitment from Washington until it was too late. So there wasn't consistency in that area. Oh, my God, I have to go. We have class. In February 2020, the United States struck a deal with the Taliban that included a timeline for withdrawal. Ackerman. OK, so see, this is very late. It's not until 2020 that the United States struck a deal with the Taliban that included a timeline for our, for our uh, leaving the country. Ackerman blames the agreement for having fatally delegitimized President Ashraf Ghani and his central government. So the president, Amit Karzai is not the president anymore. It's Ashraf Ghani. That agreement was flawed and probably accelerated the government's downfall, downfall, but it was far from a primary cause of the collapse. For all its problems, the deal should be credited as an effort to salvage the possibility of intra-Afghan peacemaking and for ensuring that the United States could withdraw without a fight. I'm late. The agreement must be judged against the backdrop of President Donald Trump's decision to pull out U.S. forces from the country. There is little evidence to suggest that the brittle Afghan governments would have remained intact had the United States withdrawn without a deal. Ackerman joins a sizable camp of critics who have blamed the United States for not being committed enough to fighting the war, but he fails to explain what being committed enough would have looked like. So if you say, I can do something better than you, you better not just say it. You better walk the walk and talk the talk. You better have something to, to prove. You have to prove it. So like if I say, well, I can do this lesson, you know, I have good slides for this lesson or whatever. It better not be in theory. I better provide the lesson plan or the slides that I have so that so that we can, you know, so that I can teach them with the with the main classroom teacher or so I can um, you know, use them so that they'll be useful to the class. I can't just verbalize and say, well, you should do this. That's not right. That's just like criticizing. You have to be helpful. Like you have to, you know, provide an answer. Like, if you don't like something, provide the right answer, like help people move through that problem so that you can get to where you want to go. Okay, what should the United States have done that it had not already done and for how much longer? Ackerman does not say. However long the United States might have stayed, the Taliban would have stayed longer. Okay, we're here making this. This is part one. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. I have to go to class. I'm late. Okay.